So Richard does need to put this on while he's speaking. He can use that one. He's got to use this oh, one so we can give him. Uh, well, he has to read for our online stuff. Yeah. So I'll. Uh, is that Richard's one? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thumbs up, fantastic. Um, thank you, everybody, for getting here on Tyler Tory. We're running a little bit behind schedule, just trying to line up a couple of things, so apologies for that. Um, pretty impressive for Eastern Staters particularly to get here after the dinner last night. I think that's a, that's a couple of uh, good uh, ticks in the box. Um, for those who uh, weren't at the dinner last night, my name's David Gilchrist and I am the Director of the Centre for Public Value here at the UWA Business School and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to the 15th Biennial Conference of the Australian New Zealand Third Sector Research and the 30th anniversary of the organisation which is very exciting. So it's lovely to be able to host the conference here in Perth in any case but to do it on such an auspicious occasion is fantastic. So. Thank you all for coming, uh, particularly uh, people from around Australia to come to Perth's wonderful weather. Um, I, keep, I see Murray Baird there. The last time you were here, I think we had similar weather. So this is Melbourne coming big and strong into uh, Western Australia's world. Um, I'd like to just make a couple of housekeeping um, comments before I do that. Though I'd like to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation to pay my respects to their elders past present and emerging, um, and to uh, say how lucky we are to be sitting, having a meeting in a university 
so close to such beautiful land that's been uh, cared for by the Noongar people for so long. So it's wonderful to be able to be here. Um, I'd also just let you know that the toilets are straight out the door to the left and all down the stairs. You can see them there, it's well signed. If we have to get out because the papers are bad or whatever it happens to be, if we have to evacuate, then we again go straight out the front door to the front of the building, turn left, and there's a big grass area just to the left of the building here. Please go uh, there. Um, other than that, the final thing I'd like to do is just to say thank you to our supporters for the conference that have made it very possible for us to be able to uh, keep the cost of the conference low, particularly given that we're holding it in Perth and travel costs, are, amongst other things, of course, are quite substantial. But I'd like to acknowledge Access Group, the Australia Institute, the Film and Foundation, Levan Legal and also Picture Partners who have all uh, contributed to be able to make this conference work. So thank you very much to those contributors. Um, now I would like to introduce Professor Ray De Silva Rosa. Uh, Ray uh, is my friend and colleague from the UWA Business School, but he's also the chair of the academic board of the University of Western Australia. So the senior most uh, governance element within the organisation uh, under the Senate. Uh, and obviously Ray has a very big role to play in terms of teaching and learning across the university and, and research as well. So it's really my great pleasure to welcome Ray uh, and to ask you to open the conference, please. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I'm obviously very good at technology. Thank you, David. On, uh, on behalf of the staff and the students of the University of Western Australia, I'd like to warmly welcome you over here to this, um, to this conference. Um, thank you very much for, for coming and making it all this way. It's a long way from over east, at least that's what we hear from the people over east anyway. Um, the, um, the, I'm from the UWA Business School, um, and um, so which, uh, I'm sorry for the style of this picture. It's a good idea at the time. But that's how I like it. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, it's uh, the business school has been around for 60 years, so I think it's uh, they're about. So I'm glad we finally got a centre for public value because we've been a centre for private value for for about 60 years. So um, it's good that we're finally developing another wing, as it were. Um, and uh, the, I expect I'm preaching to the converted, but I just want to point out that um, it's worthwhile underscoring some reasons why the study of public value is important, if only to kind of reclaim some of the intellectual ground that's been seeded. I think uh, there's a sense in which uh, looking at public value is seen as something soft and squishy and not really intellectually rigorous. Um, the, I've got to say, that's probably not the case in your field. <laughs> you know that it's not the case, but it's certainly the case amongst the more who like to think of themselves as hard nosed finance and economist type. But that's, uh, that's their flaw, not yours. Um, but the other point I want to make is I think that we're in, a, in Australia and New Zealand in a fairly unique position to contribute to this particular debate. Um, the, uh, we're quite small. Um, so this is the map of the world um, with the us over there. I prefer this kind of projecting. There's no need to. <laughs> we have to be at the bottom of the world, um, and um, we are, our share of world GDP is about 1.6 percent, which is about the same as Russia's GDP. Um, Russia, obviously, for some whatever reasons, historic looms a lot larger in the world's thing. But uh, my point is, there's no reason why Australia, New Zealand can't loom as large. Uh, despite having a fairly small GDP in this in this particular context, um, the, and I want to explain why, um, with respect to this particular quote, um, by reference to this particular quote, my my impression, and I again, I'm a near, I'm I'm, new, I'm I'm not I'm not in your field, but uh, if there's a patron of your discipline, uh, if you had to pick an economist, uh, one of the top three, say, so we you would pick would be John Kenneth Galbraith, I think um, he um, and um, he was someone very much concerned about the public welfare. And uh, this is what he said about uh, the US. Um, and he said, the family which takes its mode on serious air conditioning power steer and power bank bit out for patrol. You can read us faster than I can uh, <laughs> so let you take a moment. Um, Thank <laughs> you. 
my point here is uh, that uh, not so much that we are like this in Australia, and that's my point, that we're actually not like this in Australia. And that's the remarkable thing. The US is like this, and I'm not an anti-US American person. I think they have a lot, a lot of virtues. Um, yeah, I think in, in some ways we, our own faults are, are kind of concealed. But they talk about a closed border and the Donald Trump, and what we have here is much, much uh, harsher than anything they ever had um, in, in many ways. So um, this isn't an anti-American tirade, but I do think that we have a better sense of the public welfare and a care for it much better. I, I got lost by Google um, last week and um, I ended up in the far-flung suburbs of the northern, the northern suburbs in, um, in Perth. And um, I said, oh, who lives over here? Clearly a lot of people. Uh, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then the second thought that struck me is that if it wasn't so far from UWA, this wouldn't be a bad place to live. It's, it's really nice. The roads are clean, the parks are beautiful, the schools look great. The, the liquor store, which I went to, was enormous. I hadn't seen anything <laughs> like it was something else. Uh, but uh, it, on the whole, it wasn't too bad. And I said, this is, this is why I like this, this country. Um, there's, um, um, and on that same day, I must say I was on the plane, um, and this doesn't happen to me very often, but I happen to be sitting on the front of the plane for a change. And um, uh, next came out next to me, someone popped themselves down, and, um, and uh, he was pack suits and everything. He refused a meal. Clearly, he'd been, um, you know, this is kind of unusual. You know, most people in, in business class, at least in my, and certainly me, and grab everything, every free fruit they can get. But uh, he was, he said, nah, don't be bothered. And we got talking, and um, he was a trade assistant from up north. Um, and I um, was flying back to Melbourne, and the, and he was working in 65 degrees, and he said they only had five minutes on and off. My point simply being, I like being in a country where a trade assistant working in those conditions gets appropriately rewarded. And I think that speaks to a set of public values that many other countries don't have. Um, so my point in saying all this is that we can actually provide some leadership to the rest of the world. I think if we get the strikes, if we get the intellectual underpinnings, we've managed the conditions, but not necessarily, I think, the intellectual justification for how we develop this place. Um, again, I'm sorry, I'm speaking as a lay person, so this is no doubt all, all happy. I've got to fill up my five minutes, I'll <laughs> carry on. Um, the other point I want to make is, a large part of this is in its the intellectual ideas are important. And I'll give you an, a regrettable example from my own discipline where there's a study this is in finance um, where we find that we see that business culture and dishonesty in the banking industry. Um, and they show that employees of a large international bank behave on average honestly. However, when their professional identity as bank employees is rendered salient, a significant proportion of them become dishonest. And the effect is specific to bank employees. So clearly, culture and values matter, what we teach them. Um, and what we teach, we seem to be effectively teaching them something, but it's not what we would hope for in, in the business world. And, uh, and I think we'd like some kind of intellectual justification, which we some kind of lack in the business world. We sort of talk about this, the profit motive is the most important thing. But it doesn't have to be this way. And this is... So this is the, the, the other paradigm that I have to go about, is this notion the, that the for-profit motive is simply the way things are. Um, and I want to give, and this is the last slide, uh, I want to give one counter example. Uh, so this is one specific example of actually a much more common phenomenon in the rest of the world, which is that many large companies, many large, importantly, successful companies or organizations operate in the commercial world where the leading the owners aren't motivated by the commercial <coughs> motive, but by sense, some sense of purpose, some sense of public purpose, if you like. And one outstanding example, um, for my money at least, is, is the Tata Group, one of India's oldest conglomerates. And you might hear more about Ambani and Adani, uh, who, are, who are making getting a lot of the headlights, uh, perhaps deserved it. So, but actually, in, in India, Tata is the is India's biggest business. And this is all run by, ultimately, a charity, effectively. A group of people at the very top who actually don't have much of a stake in this. 
Now, if they can do this in this context, this can, my point being, if we can understand how this works, how this comes about, this could apply in many other areas. Why can't we have government-run institutions? The argument seems to be, for a long time intellectually, it seems to be that it has to be private because the private sector has the appropriate incentives. But what I want to point out is, and this is a little spelled out, and it's a little spelled out in the Economist as a rule, but uh, to its credit, it's written the story about how they, uh, you can have a public, a large public enterprise operating in a hard edge commercial world fueled by more a public conception of the good rather than anything else. You didn't come here for a lecture, you really can't be here for a welcome, but I couldn't resist <laughs> the opportunity in front of this audience. So, so thank you very much for your patience and thank you all the more for coming and joining us. And I want to thank David again and his colleagues for, for setting this up, for, for putting UWA on the map. This for that. Thank you, David. <laughs>
He writes for The Age, for the Sydney Morning Herald. He writes for the Saturday paper, The Monthly, and does the odd quarterly essay. Um, and he's running an institute with 48 staff. So that's Richard Dennis. He's um, a great communicator. He's a believer in the not-for-profit sector. He understands it. And I'm delighted that we can have him here this morning as our keynote, Richard Dennis. Thanks, Liz, for the very warm welcome. And um, yes, I did struggle with taxis this morning as well, so I'm told that's not unusual for your bad weather. Um, uh, so I don't have any PowerPoint slides to share with you today. I'm firmly of the view that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> that might just be that other people are better prepared than me. But hopefully I am well prepared because I've been working uh, in and around the community sector uh, for most of my life uh, and a lot of the time that I've spent outside the community sector has been within academia uh, and or in Parliament House. I'm interested in policy, I'm interested in politics because I'm interested in democracy. And while it's not very polite to say it, you can't have a democracy without politicians. It's literally impossible. You cannot have a democracy without politicians. And indeed, you can't have a democracy without politics. Because politics, well, while economics defines itself as the science of the efficient allocation of scarce resources, politics, as a friend once observed to me, is concerned not with the efficient allocation of scarce resources, but with the allocation of scarce resources. And that tension between kind of, you know, allegedly objective academic notions of what good policy is and what is efficient and what is effective, the, the, the external assessment of evidence-based policy and what we should do in a democracy is actually constitutionally irrelevant. To be clear, the term evidence-based policy is not mentioned once in our constitution. There is nothing in our constitution that says we should allocate money to, uh, to issues based on any notions of evidence or anything to do with the policy cycle or uh, the kind of things we teach ourselves and we teach our students. What the constitution tells us is who gets to decide who we allocate scarce resources to. And to be crystal clear, by definition, those people are politicians. Yet we've told our community, we've told our civil society that politics is dirty, that politics is a dirty word, and that to engage in advocacy, oh, that's a fine line, isn't it? It's a slippery slope. We don't actually legitimise the participation in our democracy of our civil society. It's something to be uh, concerned by rather than something to be embraced. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, if the suffragettes were organising in Australia today, do you think they'd be very effective at uh, winning government tenders for work? Serious question. But if the suffragettes were trying to organise in Australia today, would they succeed in tendering in any service delivery contracts? for the Commonwealth or state governments that you're aware of? I don't know the answer, it's hypothetical when you think about these things. Would they fit in at your organisation? Would the suffragettes theory of change, which to be clear in Australia wasn't uh, overtly violent, but there were, uh, you know, there was definitely violence attached to the suffragette movement, particularly in the UK. But even here in Australia, it was relatively peaceful. It was still disruptive. So to be clear, a question I think we should all ask ourselves is, do you think the suffragettes would fit within the risk appetite of your board? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know you or your board. So what about their theory of change of the suffragettes? Would they have been better off being inside the tent, running an inside track, working closely with government? especially while government funded them? Or do we think 
with the full sweep of history that their external scrutiny and their powerful demands for change are more effective. To be clear, life is so much harder than binaries. To be clear, I don't know what the right advocacy strategy for you or your organisation or a particular issue is, but I am quite worried about how systematically uh, civil society in Australia has merged into a service delivery arm of governments. State, federal, local, Labor and Liberal, not singling out any particular organisation or any particular level of government, but I am asking us to reflect on what's the consequences of that for engagement in what some people call evidence-based policy, what some people call advocacy, and what some people call politics. Because the boundaries between these things are not at all clear, but in organisations where fear of losing government funding, fear of uh, losing philanthropic support for being, quote, too political, fear of falling outside of contractual obligations, or simply just the fear that getting on the wrong side of a government on an advocacy issue might be a threat to the revenue model of an organisation, these are challenges that we all collectively need to face. Now, I really, really thought Kate Cheney's speech last night was very interesting. I think she raised a lot of uh, good questions. And I think one of them that really sits at the heart of a lot of these challenges is at what level do we as citizens in a democracy think we can drive change? Is our only role to vote every couple of years? Because don't get me wrong, it was actually the vote that was motivating so much of the suffragette movement. I'm not in any way diminishing the importance of our vote when it comes to influencing a democracy. And of course, some people like to run for office, which again, the suffragettes weren't allowed to do, which was what was motivating a lot of their, uh, uh, motivating a lot of their campaign. So individuals can vote, and individuals can run for parliament, but democracy asks a lot more of us than that. So how, comma, if at all, do we organise ourselves, whether it's uh, for a community or for uh, a so-called interest group, are they the same things? Is, is a community organisation calling for better services and a business group calling for tax cuts for the for-profit companies it represents, are they both interest groups? Or is there a difference between a community group and, and a peak body for for-profit business? Because the way that we're talking about our democratic structures doesn't really, thanks to the focus on individualism, thanks to the neoliberal idea that everyone is there to look after themselves, almost by definition, if you accept, as most economists don't, by the way, but if you accept the very simplistic economic models that suggest that all individuals are only motivated by their own self-interest, if your starting point is that's all that motivates people, then when a group of people form a community organisation to call for better services or more funding or the protection of a particular bit of the environment, if your starting point is a neoliberal one of individuals acting in their self-interest, then when you see a group of people organising, surely they're just actually doing it for themselves. There's a fundamental tension between the idea that individuals are self-interested always and the fact that anyone would join any group to help someone else. And in the last couple of decades, I think it's quite clear in Australia that in conflating those two things, we've actually lost faith, not just in the importance of community organisations, but the power of them. Now, I'm cynical enough or uh, observed enough things at close range, depending on your perspectives, to think that big changes in the way our culture uh, perceives things don't just happen by accident. I think that individuals and organisations and governments can drive culture and can drive uh, changes in our sense of self. And to be clear, I do think that the Howard government was particularly both motivated and effective in changing the way that that we see our democracy, that we see our role in democracy, and most importantly for this audience, 
that we see the role of civil society in our democracy. And John Howard had a number of quite clear objectives. One was he wanted to shrink the role of the state. And one was that he wanted to enhance the role of the individual. And another was that quite clearly he wanted to marginalise uh, his critics. And he was very effective at doing all three of those things in the way that he, and he was not alone, but I think he was very effective in, I think he was very effective in achieving all three of those objectives in the way that he embraced and pursued a strategy of making civil society compete with other elements of civil society for government money to provide services to the community. Because by privatising service delivery to the community sector, which is a lot of what happened, these, these services used to be provided by the state, by privatising them and outsourcing them to civil society, he simultaneously achieved his objective of privatising and he simultaneously achieved his objective of silencing a lot of his critics. And he simultaneously achieved setting up a conflict between his critics. And by the way, he actually managed to lower the pain conditions of the workers providing those services at the same time. Maybe that was an accident, or maybe it was actually very clever. I want to talk briefly about pain conditions. In, uh, in the care sector in the Australian economy, of which civil society have become uh, the dominant players in, in, in many elements, particularly in things like aged care. We talk briefly about paying conditions and what drives them in Australia today, because I think it fits really importantly with this kind of understanding of what's happened in Australia. As we've privatised and outsourced, privatised and outsourced to sectors that always feel poor, no one working in a not-for-profit is allowed to feel rich, are they? No, no not-for-profit's ever allowed to say, gee, we're raking it in at the moment. Now's a good time to increase people's pay. Because if you work in civil society, you know if you're paying your staff more, you're actually spending less on the people you care for. What wonderful, perhaps accidental, or perhaps brilliant, what, 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 what a wonderful way for, for groups not just to, uh, to self-censor in their advocacy, but to self-censor in their wage claims, to, to make an overt tension between paying people in the care sector more and caring for people more. I want to give you an anecdote. It's perfectly, uh, it's about me. This happened, but uh, no names will be harmed. Um, I was once invited to... Uh, go and speak to a group of uh, high-paid executives at a weekend retreat uh, who were there to reflect on and learn how to cope with the stresses of being rich. Um, <laughs> you know how it is. You've got lots of money and no time and you never quite feel uh, like in control of your life, even though you're in control of so many other people's lives. So your work pays for you to go somewhere nice for the weekend to, to recharge and think about coping strategies for being rich. Anyway, part of that sort of gig is, you know, you need some provocative people to come and challenge you, you know, into Richard Dennis. Um, and it's always dangerous to ask me to be provocative because I promise I will deliver. So I'm sitting in this group of people, a dozen or so, and I said, who here thinks that you need to pay your staff high wages to attract and retain the best ones? Oh, yes, yes, I can do that. And who here thinks that we need to you know, pay bonuses to motivate and incentivize people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, pay peanuts, get monkeys, all that sort of stuff. All the, all the individual, you know, focus on the individual, pay the individual up. Okay, who here in the room's got a kid in childcare? A few hands go up. Okay, how do you feel about the fact that your kids are being cared for by the lowest paid people in the country? You've just said you need to pay high wages to get good talent, and your kids are being cared for by the lowest paid people in the country. And one guy who is enormous credit said, um, well, I feel good. I said, oh, why is that? And he said, well, I don't want my kids being raised by someone who's motivated by money. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. Anyway, we're not done yet. <laughs> I said, you mean you don't want your kids raised by someone like you? <laughs> And he said, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. 
And this is why women get terrible pay in the Australian care sector. Because their low wages are proof they're in the right job for them. Yeah, I'm seeing the heads going in the hands now. Their low pay is proof that all is well in the world. Their low pay is proof that humble, caring, giving people are getting paid a pittance to look after kids, while egomaniacs motivated purely by self-interest are getting paid a fortune. It is not an accident that women, particularly in the female-dominated care sector, are low paid in Australia. It's a policy choice. And it's a policy choice that reassures a whole bunch of people. Oh, yes, I wouldn't want nurses motivated by money. I wouldn't want teachers motivated by money. I wouldn't want, I want the nice people to do that. <laughs> so that greedy individualists like me can pay low tax. I don't want to pay more tax to boost the pay of people that shouldn't be caring for kids motivated on money. Why should I pay more tax to give them more money? The fact that they're doing it cheap is proof they're the right people in the right job. And guess who most of those people work for? They work for civil society. They work in the not-for-profit sector. So when we privatised and when we outsourced all this once highly unionised public sector work to the care sector, we didn't just achieve an ideological objective, we radically reshaped the distribution of income and we changed the way civil society behaves. So when civil society are sitting there worried if they speak out, should they be speaking out to get better wages for their staff or should they be speaking out to get better services for the people that they want to care about or if they speak out, Will they just lose money for both? Now, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't work in a service delivery care organisation. I don't know how other organisations deal with these tensions, but I don't think those tensions wound, there by, wound up there by accident. I think it's classic divide and conquer, and it's the exact opposite of civil society coming together to solve a problem rather than treat the symptoms of it. That, that question of, you know, when, when will my charity need to go out of business? Well, I don't think most people in the service delivery organisations in civil society in Australia think they'll be going out of business anytime soon. But keep in mind, their business doesn't make a sense in profit, which is fine. It doesn't pay very high wages, which is a pity. And most people delivering it probably think they're not providing the high quality care that motivated them to get into the sector. So there's some big structural problems there, there's some big economic problems there, but I would argue there's an even bigger democratic problem there. Now that said, we're talking here, well, that'll be my dad. <laughs> um, we're talking here about a very big part and what should be a very powerful part of the Australian economy. We know in Australia that the fossil fuel industry is the backbone of our economy. We know this because so many people that get paid so much money have said it for so long that it must be true. It's just that there's this quirky little outfit called the Australian Bureau of Statistics, and it tells me that around 20,000 people work in the gas industry and about 45,000 people work in the coal industry. About 1.4 million people work in the not-for-profit sector. 1.4 million people, according to the ACNC, employed in the not-for-profit sector. 1.4 million, 60,000 people working in oil, gas and coal combined. Anglicare and Uniting Care employ more people than the entire fossil fuel industry in Australia. But when we talk about what's good for employment, when we talk about creating jobs, when we talk about what employees need, when we talk about what employers need, how often do we turn to civil society for that voice? So the, the size and the significance of, of, the, of civil society should not be underestimated, but it is, including by the people in the sector itself, who actually believe 
and you know, based on a lot of conversations I've had over a lot of years, that governments, quote, can't afford to spend more on services, quote, can't afford to, or, quote, don't have the evidence to convince them that a particular policy is desirable. Well, Australia is one of the richest countries in the world. We have a small population and an enormous economy. As you just heard, our GDP is about the size of Russia's. We are one of the richest countries in the world, but because we're one of the lowest taxed countries in the developed world, again, not an accident, decades of choice, because we're one of the lowest tax countries in the world, we've been made to feel poor. And we know that we couldn't listen to the recommendations of the Aged Care Royal Commission and, and implement them. We know we couldn't do that. We know we couldn't spend more money uh, to increase unemployment benefits. Money doesn't grow on trees, you know. We know that we couldn't uh, spend more money to protect the environment. Where would the money come from, Richard? We're about to spend $250 billion on income tax cuts. $250,000 million. We're about to spend, that's a quarter of a trillion. And we're also about to spend a quarter of a trillion dollars to build 12 new nuclear subs to replace the six we haven't used yet. We are not poor. We are not lacking in cash. And I promise you, there was no comparative economic modelling done that proved that spending money on tax cuts for high-income blokes was better for the economy than providing free childcare, which would overwhelmingly benefit women. You know why no evidence was harmed in the making of that decision? Because no one cared. Evidence isn't mentioned in the Constitution. And a whole bunch of people with the constitutional power to allocate or to collect and then allocate uh, our, our revenue decided that tax cuts for blokes was more important than free childcare. And that's as it should be, because that's what our Constitution says, that's how democracy works. But while you guys, not you, but I'm worried about the person sitting next to you, while, while you guys tell yourselves there's not enough money for your priority area, I'd suggest that there's a more brutal truth that you don't want to confront. And that is that there is money. It's just that people making the decisions didn't care about you. When you hear a politician say they can't afford to do something, you just heard a politician say they'd rather do something else. Own that. If you really want to look after vulnerable people, then understand that every time a politician says they, quote, can't afford to insert, solve problem here, you just actually heard them say, I'd rather solve another problem for someone else. And that's their job. That's what we elect them to do. They are one of us. That's how democracy works. We elect politicians to go and allocate resources on our behalf. And unfortunately, and I'll conclude on this point, despite the size and the potential power of the sector, despite the potential voice, not just of the employees of the sector, but the, the customers, the people they provide services to, the donors to, despite the enormous potential power of civil society, its voice has been relatively silenced. And I'm not saying there aren't brave civil society organisations out there making noise at the moment. Bob Brown got himself arrested again recently for protesting against the destruction of native forest trees that hold an endangered species. He got arrested because the laws in Tasmania make it very easy to arrest protesters. You've never seen anyone arrested for wage theft because laws matter. <laughs> and we collectively make them. And when we divide and conquer civil society with money, when we divide and conquer them, making them compete against each other, when we scare people with the threat of prosecution or losing their tax deductibility or losing their charitable status or even going to jail for protest, then that, not coincidentally, has an impact on the behaviour of a lot of organisations. It didn't stop the suffragettes, many of whom were obviously elected, but it certainly has had a chilling impact on, on the way that the enormous potential power of civil society in Australia has been relatively silenced. Now, maybe that's fine. It feels like a problem to me, but it's a democracy. 
And in a democracy, again, our elected representatives respond to the pressures they're under. They respond to the issues that they, they, they think voters will change their votes on. And maybe we're just such a rich country, and maybe we are actually so instinctively individualist that we actually just don't mind that women in the caring professions get paid not much and that high income blokes are about to get enormous tax cuts. There's nothing in the economics profession that tells me what's fair. There's nothing in the constitution that tells us what's fair. It's actually up to the people we represent the parliament to decide what's fair. And to be clear, at the moment in Australia, the gap between those with the most and those with the least has been rising for years, which potentially suggests that people are happy with it, or potentially it suggests it's time for those that are unhappy with it to get better organised, to do a different job of civil society and change things if they can. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to use the karaoke. <laughs> I promise I won't sing. Um, well, thank you so much, Richard. You're recording this as well, too. Um, thank, thank you so much, Richard. Very um, great scope in your presentation, and certainly a lot to think about for everyone here. Um, and I certainly share many of your uh, political analyses and sentiments. But we do have the pleasure of having two key people from the uh, community sector here um, with us. So. Deborah is here from, I'm sorry, Rua. Rua, Rua yeah, Rua Community Services. And we have um, Louise here from WACOS, the West Australian uh, Community Services, oh, sorry, WACOS, Council, Council, Council Social, Social Services, Services sorry. Yeah. Um, and they're going to respond in some sense to what Richard has presented, but also give us a great opportunity of hearing about the state of the sector in Western Australia. So just to begin with, um, I wonder if you could talk about what could be described as the starvation of social services um, organisations in Western Australia under, over the last few years. In, in, yeah. It's when we turn these on, I think oh, you think okay. well, I'll turn it on. <laughs> Would you like to start? Yeah. yeah. It, it sounds like that to me, but I've got a really big voice. I actually don't. <laughs> yes. I grew up with two older brothers, and you didn't have a big voice, and if you weren't quick, you didn't get fed. Um, yeah, my name's Louise Lee. I'm the CEO of the West Australian Council of Social Service. I've been there for six, seven years now, and it's a really privileged position to be in. Love what you said, Richard. I agree with, I think, about 95% of what you actually said. Um, and I just want to put this in context. I am going to be talking about Western Australia because it's the context in which I work. Um, and just to, for those in the Eastern States who are actually here, over the past two years, this state has posted close to a $12 billion surplus. We are a state that is rich, without a doubt, there is no deficit budgets being posted. I 100% agree with Richard, what Richard said about taxes and we have a very low, we don't tax a program and we especially don't tax the rich and we're going to be getting more tax cuts. But even within the tax system here in Western Australia, last two years close to a $12 billion sur surplus. It's a really big state and anybody who actually works here knows that if you, the further and further you go out, and the more and more remote you actually go, the cost to deliver services becomes increasingly more difficult, plus the workforce of who you can engage with. And, the, and I'm not saying they're not professional staff out in regional WA, not saying that at all, but the pool of people who you can actually attract. 
We're also, and I'm pretty sure this is right across the nation at the moment, is we have an absolute massive housing shortage here in this state at the moment. That's massively impacting not only the clients in which we serve, but our own workforce. We know of stories out in regional WA where there's women working family domestic violence services who are sleeping in their car because they can't actually find accommodation. And that's inherently the lack of investment for at least 20 years, some in the sector will say 50 years, or the failings of state and federal governments to invest in the social infrastructure that's actually required in affordable housing. And we're actually paying the price for it now. A year ago, if we were with our state members of parliament and we would use the term, there's a housing crisis, they say, no, it's not. We can't talk about a housing crisis. We don't have a housing crisis. And just go and look east and they'll still say, just look east because it's a lot more expensive over there. People have, don't have it so tough here in Western Australia. We've got 0.01% vacancies in, in rental markets in some regional areas here in Western Australia. So the, the landscape, not only for our clients, but also for the people working in our industry, and as Richard said, is predominantly women, and I'll talk about that more, is so difficult at the moment to meet the cost of living. We're having people leaving our sector because of course if you go and work, and this has happened before during the mining construction boom, you'd earn a bucket load more money if you go and work for a mining company as a cleaner than it would be in the profession that you studied and cared about. You went and got a degree in. It's, it, economically, it's better for you to actually leave. And just to give you an idea, at the moment Wacos is conducting a survey because we have this ongoing battle here in Western Australia around appropriate indexation and how community services are funded. Um, we know that the cost of living has got up 7.6%. By law, by law, in the award, and there was a thing called Equal Numeration Order back in 2013 where we saw a 45% increase in wages over 10 years because our sector was so incredibly underpaid. Um, and the, the recent industrial relations have increased, you know, the wages for this year to 4.5% plus their superannuation. So by law, wages have to increase by 5.1%. That still doesn't hit the cost of living, but at least it was 5.1%. We had a battle with this government here about there's a supply chain issue because the majority of the funding does come through the state. And how you fund the services, be it FTV, be it homelessness services, be it youth services. We were had an indexation rate at 2.5. We, we won. We got it up to 3.53%. But the increase is 5.1. And this is an accumulative shortfall. Just on indexation, there's so many other measures. Here in Western Australia, we've measured the shortfall now over the last five years is about 12.75%. And I'll just finish on this because I can talk underwater, is that we're doing this survey at the moment. We've had close to 90 responses, 50%, about 50% metro, 50% regional, and we're really going to do the analysis. And David, this morning, I've either pinged him, he's going to actually help us do the analysis around this. 73% of those community services are responded and say they're going to actually have to reduce services because by law, and rightly so, they should be paying the increase in wages to staff, which is still well below the cost of living. So the only option they have is to reduce hours and reduce staffing hours. So that's the state of Western Australia at the moment that is starving in a, in a state that's posted over the last two years a $12 billion surplus. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, Deborah, would you mind responding to that scenario from a CEO yeah. perspective? Well, I, think, well, I, know this works. Um, I think if I think about um, starvation, you know, it's like, it's like a frog in the ball in water. My sense is in the service space. We run an organisation, we have over 400 staff. So we're not super, super big, we're not very, very small. Um, about a year ago, we had a surplus and an underspend in one of our programs, and so we made a decision due to the cost of living to provide an extra payment to our staff at the end of financial year. I want to call it the bonus uh, because I struggle with those concepts. 
What really struck me, the amount was, I think, relatively insignificant. I think it was about $2,500 per worker across the organisation. The number of emails that I received from my staff, which still makes me quite emotional, that told me that enabled them to get their dental work done, it enabled them to pay a um, piece of their mortgage they were concerned due to the cost of living they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't make. Now that reality isn't my reality. I'm paid as a CEO. I, you know, I have a husband who's in a profession that pays awfully well, so I don't struggle with those issues. But to have a significant proportion of my staff say to me that a $2,500 additional payment of which there's no one in the government here or my public sector colleagues, uh, I really ought not to have done. Uh, it should have been money that I returned to the funder because I've got no capacity to keep any surplus that I make if I produce efficient outcomes. Um, was heartbreaking for me. We turn away over 300 women and their children every year who seek refuge from family and domestic violence. One in 10 women will die every year in this country and their children from family violence. There are 14,000 people on the public wait list for housing. Within the housing wait list, there is a priority housing list and then there's a priority priority housing list. And those in the priority priority housing list who are most vulnerable wait in average in excess of 365 days for placement. So we're not starving. We're just not living. And I think there's a fundamental difference in that. And, you know, Richard, it re I really resonated. You know, I've been a CEO over 12 years in the sector for over 20 years. And I think I've just come fundamentally to the view that people don't care about our community services. They don't care about civil society. And fundamentally, I think they don't care because we don't value women. Um, the, the underlying misogyny that has crept through all of our structures in society um, are profuse. And we don't actually see them for what they are. And when 75% of my work <coughs> is women, um, and many of them are single women, I often feel that I am equally contributing to the deficiencies in their life by paying them less than what is um, I suppose, a wage that is worth living for. Thank you. Um, I think those are obviously really key issues that you raised, Richard, by bringing in the notion of pay as part of the problem. But I wonder if we could go to some of the other points that Richard made that you might uh, have thought about, um, particularly, I guess, the link between the role and importance of the civil society sector and democracy and those connections that we should establish. Um, and also then in that role, what's your views on disruptive advocacy and the kind of advocacy that you feel your organisations can bring? And perhaps um, how delivery um, in the, of your sector has been affected systematically by its exclusion in terms of the agenda, the political agenda of governments. You know, that's quite a lot. Well, that's three things before morning tea. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm post 50, so that's really hard to make the time. I think one of the things, you know, I think the, um, I like the way you phrased um, the impact of the Howard years in terms of what we now see. Um, we see it particularly in the space of, I think, um, you know, the concept, the unproven lack of evidence-based concept that competition leads to better outcomes for people that we work with. So the drive in particularly poor public government policy that competition will create better value for money, which is another concept that I think we have distorted within the whole um, relationship with government and the community services sector. Um, and that somehow competition will, will drive greater innovation. Our lived experience as agencies has been the thing that drives better outcomes is collaboration. Um, and yet collaboration is an unfunded mechanism to drive outcomes. And yet I think when we have seen that in particular social movements like the WA Alliance to End Homelessness, um, work we're doing in the equity project, it is agencies coming to, organisations coming together collectively 
using their own resources to drive collaboration in, in the space, you know, outside of competition. The other thing that I would say, um, the journalist uh, Johan Hari wrote the book Lost Connections, um, and he also wrote the wonderful book about the war, the war against drugs. Um, and one of the things I think that we see in this divide and conquer, this kind of silencing of the voice of advocacy, um, what, what gurgles up so much in the space of community services and working with people is that the sense of loss of communal meaning, who we are as society and how a sense of being lost about how I contribute and are a, and part of the whole, I think is a critical component for us as well. Look, I certainly think in WA, um, both, in, both in Liberal and a Labor government, we have struggled in finding the tension about advocacy and the, the, the real absolute fear that if you advocate as an agency, you will lose funding. And the choice, that choice that we seem to be making about the impact of losing funding and paying staff versus losing funding and not being able to provide uh, services is an ongoing tension. It's a tension, I think, that creates a workforce that won't strike, that won't take collective action, as we've just recently seen in the nursing space, um, and that effectively appears to be subjugated into positions where they accept whatever that is given to them. And it's a real tension. It's a tension as CEO um, that I walk all the time in terms of aligning myself with the minister so that I can make sure we can drive the change that we need um, and advocating for the systemic change that we need whilst also holding on to the individual. So, yeah. oh, no, no, thank you. Well, I just wanted to, so thank you. And that, my key point is that tension is not an accident, right? I'm sorry. It's not an accident. Smart people built it. They put it there on purpose. Yeah. It's not going to go away. It's there to make your life one of excruciating choice. It's not an accident. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, we've so, not we as individuals, we as a community have so kind of drunk that neoliberal Kool-Aid that the government is somehow short of money. It's not that it only allocates money when there's strong evidence to support something. It doesn't. You know, we've so kind of, we wind up blaming ourselves for circumstances that have been deliberately created such that we sit here thinking, should I be advocating for my staff or should I be advocating for the people my staff are trying to help? And that's not an accident. And, and until we kind of see that that's what was deliberately created, it's going to be, I would suggest, impossible to kind of punch out of the corner that we've been deliberately put in by smart people who can afford a quarter of a trillion in tax cuts for their friends and a quarter of a trillion for subs we didn't know we needed. But apparently there's no money to pay women in the caring <coughs> sectors more. It's not an accident. You know. <coughs> In regards to drinking the Kool-Aid, I, I know, and it might be the people I hang out with, we have drunk the Kool-Aid. We believe that both federally and state, they can afford it at 100% agree. But I think the general public have drunk the Kool-Aid. And there was a, there's a really good example. I remember what happened when you get your tax return and you turn it over and they show where the money's mm. been spent. That was an absolute deliberate strategy that shows the most of it goes to um, social security payments, but if you actually really want to break that down, now, most of that goes to age pensions, which you know nobody's going to do to disagree with. If you went and asked your neighbours, should somebody get pensioned, that people think it was going to people who are unemployed, and I remember having that conversation with people. So there's been an absolute deliberate mechanism to say, and there's this belief, and there's this belief in state government that our premier, we are just a cost on the economy. He actually doesn't see the benefits. And I really did appreciate your conversation because WACOS, as a peak body, two primary purposes that we actually had is to provide evidence-based policy. That's what we do and what we actually do all the time. Sometimes it's accepted and most of the time blinkers are put on because it actually doesn't go with the narrative of what this government wants at this particular time and what's actually important to them, which is jobs in the economy. <coughs> 
That's the narrative of the West Australian government and that is all that they actually measure, even though once you put up the evidence-based policy. So as a peak body, as a member base, I believe there's more and more pressure put on peaks bodies, as it should by its members, because the members are too frightened to speak up. And, they, and at times um, it, it does waver, but our members want us to be that public voice up front. But we too are in that bind of trying to work behind the scenes, a hundred percent free with you. Then we get a meet minister's ear, we can just change it, we can just bend it slightly. Because if we go public, they will shut down on us, literally shut down, stop having meetings with us. And at times, I've said really bad things about, you know, will name me in the media and they'll name Anglicare, they'll name Lua, and just that we're full of shit, basically. And then they'll quote some big, lofty figure, we put $5 million or $20 million, but you need to break it down because the general public don't understand. And for me, personally, I struggle all the time because I can sit in meetings and I just want to leap across the table. But I don't think I'm being authentic when I'm dealing with certain ministers or certain bureaucrats. But it's not about me being right. It's not about how I feel. It's about the outcome. So even though at times in your own advocacy you will question, am I being authentic? <coughs> at the deep root, you say to yourself, I am being authentic because I don't care. It's not about having a relationship with the minister. How best do I get the outcome that is actually best for the communities in which we serve? It is a, absolutely, it's a really hard environment to work in at the moment. I might talk a bit later about this based policy. But if you're living in Western Australia, <coughs> Um, at the moment, and you don't see the, the, the media at the moment around our justice system, um, you'd be living under a rock, and hopefully all the people in the eastern states have seen the media around our justice system as well, but I'll leave it at that at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. And I guess just responding to Richard and, and your comment, Deborah, about the underlying misogyny, the people who made those decisions were men, primarily, and the exclusion of um, the role of women as a, a kind of equal gender is really at the core of the failure to recognise the feminised workforce, etc. So, well, and I would make the comment that you know Victor Havel, the Czech dissident, talked about you know in terms of fighting communism, what was required wasn't was it wasn't a war, but was a revolution of the human heart. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to reclaim the concept of care as a transformative agent for our world rather than the demonising of it as a feminine concept that sits somewhere below. And so, you know, my start of my career as a nurse, the, the concept of care I think is revolutionary. Um, and I, I think as civil society our job is to reclaim the revolutionary nature of care that doesn't, doesn't negate business or economics, but it has an equal standing in the world and, and hence it's why I'm such a strong proponent of the concept of care because I think it is transformative. Yeah. So, no, 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 thank you. It's wonderful to hear. And, and just to be clear, there's nothing in any economics textbook ever that says when we spend money on childcare or aged care, it is better or worse for the economy than when we spend it on a holiday or a new television. This is not economics, right? It's just buying a service. And if we value a health service or, 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 or an education service or a massage service, if we value that highly and we want to spend money on it, there's nothing in an economics textbook that says that's less valuable than mining something out of the ground to make something that we use once and chuck away. That's not economics. Um, but just let me make, a, I think, an important political point that I was trying to make in my speech, but I think it's clear listening to these guys talk. Um, imagine there was no service delivery from any civil society in Australia, none, and no public funding for any civil society in Australia, not a cent, and that we formed groups and those groups said, I can't believe you're treating women fleeing domestic violence that bad. And I can't believe that you're paying the unemployed so little live on. And we just did advocacy, all of us, and none of us did any service delivery. 
how would the government of the day frame us up as rent seekers? And trying to look after ourselves. Because what they've actually done is create an environment where you asking for more money for more community services is on the same democratic and moral level as a business group asking for a tax cut. You're just interest groups. You're just an, another in the conga line of greed that wants the government to give you something. And that's how our premier sees us. It Western. is exactly, exactly how your premier sees it. Western Australia as a cost, and we're bleating. And, and yeah, you want something slowing. for you. Yeah. So my point is, so I'm not saying you shouldn't do service delivery, but look how it's been distorted and contorted, and I would say broken beyond recognition. Because if I'm advocating for more funding for domestic violence shelters, and you're advocating for tax cuts. Apparently, we're on the same page. Apparently, we are morally and democratically equal, and we are both to be suspect because we're both just making self interested claims. How are we seeing? Thank you. You've thrown my whole agenda up. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, Louise, I don't know if you wanted to add to Deborah's comments about care because. The, the idea of a care economy is something that I think we've just put it on the, the broader picture, Richard. But, um, is there any potential for changing how people do value care? There definitely is. There's, there's multiple ways that can actually be achieved. And let the politicians have a role in this and how they speak and how they discuss and how they engage. And it is different in different states. We know Michael Andrews, for example, has worked really closely with VCOS and actually sees the value of care. And we can see it actually happening around the world. There's this, there's this, oh, okay. actually, I'm just going to go back a step. The care economy implies itself we're a separate economy to the rest of the economy. So I actually don't like the statement. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a mining industry, you don't have a mining economy. So the people and the community service sector, we are part of the economy, we are part of society, we are we are part of the, the woven infrastructure of what actually makes democracy work. So I don't like the term care economy um, because we are not something separate that's just a cost that sits over here that's not important. Um, sorry, I, I forgot where I was actually going. So that, that I yeah, had an absolute issue with that particular statement. But as can you ask the question again? <laughs> well, I just wanted you to reflect a bit. You did mention um, Dan Andrews, not Michael, yeah. but, uh, in Victoria, and then you were going to relate that to the Western Australian context. Yeah. Um, in the Western Australian context about how important the community service sector is and services that are actually provided um, to the multitude of people, and everyone has a touch point, be it from childcare, through to aged care, to if you need support through financial counselling, there's touch points all along the way. Um, I don't believe it's highly valued here in Western Australia, and I don't think it's highly valued within the broader community either. I do believe during COVID, um, there was some elevation. We were seen as, the community service was seen as essential services that, you know, basically society would crash. If they didn't continue, and that included childcare, that includes the homeless services, FDB, we were put on the essential services. Yeah, I thought that at the time, and there was many in my office, as you can imagine, they're a bit left in their thinking, and there was some, you know, about to jump on the rooftop and say, down to capitalism, it's all going to happen because of COVID. That didn't quite happen. But coming out of the end of that, I don't think we were able to grasp or really lean in and to exploit what COVID actually demonstrated about those people who work in the community service sector and how important the community service sector is to our community and to our society. It's like we've gone back to business as usual and we're still on the lowest of the totem pole, especially when it comes to wages. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. I think we could have this conversation for about two more hours easily. Yeah. Um, and I'd perhaps ask you both to let, well, three of you to make some final 
wrapping up comments, if you don't mind. Do you want to give us yeah, yeah, a um, I, I want to be optimistic because I often say the community service sector, one of its key values is hope. Tenacity and hope, because otherwise we'd all actually walk away. So I'm always hopeful there will be change. Um, and with the change of guard at a federal level, um, we are seeing a change in language. We know, you know, women and gender pay equity very much on the agenda. How it flows through, we've seen a commitment from the industrial relations saying age care 15% sign up at least 25, but the federal government said whatever that comes through, we will commit, we will pay for it. But what I'm really excited about is the language around the wellbeing. So we know in this state there is no conversation at a political level about the well-being of our communities, which includes social, that, that includes the economy, social and the environment and culture. That, they're the four elements that are made up of how the well-being of a community is going. We're hearing that on the federal stage and we, we know when we've watched and we study and look at other states, I'm not sure if anybody hears from New Zealand, I'm a bit of a fan of the Kiwis, <laughs> um, that they, um, and under Jacinta, the, the introduction of sort of child wellbeing was absolutely, she was absolutely adamant about it. So it's the lens in which we view things, the, the lens in which we gather data will reflect on the lens of how the government invests of what's actually important. We know we've seen it in Wales as well. So hang on to hope that there may be a change, but um, you know the federal government has to be a bit more courageous and also in some of the, the high-end tax cuts to afford it. I think um, I'd like for the general community and politicians in particular to remember that not everything that we measure is of value and not everything that is of value can be measured. Um, and I think if I, I do have hope, and I think one of the things, one of the joys of working in community services is that I draw my hope from the reality of the people that we work with. If, if they can navigate the system and the trauma of their lives and come out of that, then surely we as a society can get our shit together and make decisions around the allocation of resources that is based on need and evidence rather than whether it will win me a political seat. So if our clients can do it and, they, and they're stacked, the odds are stacked against them to have outcomes for their lives, then surely we, we can do that. Um, I'm, I'm by nature a very optimistic uh, person who's fueled by rage. <laughs> uh, hope is not a strategy, uh, but what's the point in being hopeless? So we're sitting here in one of the richest countries in the world, and the only thing stopping us, the only thing stopping us from spending $100 billion a year more caring for people, which would just bring us up to something radical called the OECD average, the only thing stopping is spending a hundred thousand million dollars a year extra caring for other people is the political process. Right? There's nothing in economics, there's nothing in our constitution, there's nothing in law, there's nothing in our history that says we can't do it. It's just that other people have worked hard and smart to get the world they want. And maybe that's right. Maybe we're just the crazy minority but there is no structural barrier to radically changing the size and shape of our economy, brackets including the so-called care economy. There is no constraint except our imagination, our resolve, our creativity. But I would challenge you to think, are our structures up to it? Because if we've now, if our structures have now been so co-opted by people who do not share that vision, what are the odds that the structures that are, that, are, that are successfully delivering for people who want the opposite are the same structures that would get us somewhere else? So, you know, as a, as a think tank, the Australia Institute delivers no services for the government, state or federal. And I feel <coughs> no pressure when I call them out on things. So if it's hard for your group, if it's even hard for your peak bodies, Maybe you need something different. And it doesn't actually cost millions of bucks to speak the truth, but you better build some structures that are morally and democratically strong enough to cope 
with the pressure of going hard up against people who love the fact that women are paid a pittance because they're not going to stop. You have to make them change. So new structures, I would suggest, which doesn't mean existing structures don't play a role, but maybe time to think bigger. Um, well, thank you so much. I think it's been a very exciting um, and provocative way of starting the conference. And just have little tiny, tiny tokens. Of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's smaller than Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Professor Ruth Phillips as well for uh, chairing that panel, much appreciated. Uh, we have one final session uh, before we break for morning tea. Uh, Kim Roach from Access Group is going to talk about uh, projects uh, between UWA and Access Group in relation to trying to create data to help to do some of the things that we've just been talking about. So I'll just load up. All right, I'll hand it over to you, Kim. Thank you. I also have a big voice, so I'm not sure that I need to be mic'd up. Um, so, so much thought-provoking stuff been happening over the last two days, and um, I'm here from the corporate sector, so um, from a very um, successful software company called The Access Group. And um, I'd like to thank David for inviting us to collaborate uh, in this conference uh, because we are quite passionate uh, in supporting the broader not-for-profit community. Uh, not, uh, we've originally started in the UK um, and we've just recently uh, uh, in the last three or four years, started in the APAC division. So my name's Kim Roach and I'm a product specialist of our financial products, but we also specialise in payroll and just hearing about the data you need to collect from that payroll area is quite interesting as we move forward. I have had experience in the not-for-profit sector as a finance manager in aged care, David and I first met many years ago working um, with the Freemasons Homes for the Age. So uh, also in Catholic schools, so, you know, education is another area as well. But even down to sporting groups and just small community groups and what that brings to community, I am quite passionate about. So who is Access? You won't have ever heard of us. Um, like I said, that we are the largest UK software uh, company uh, providing business management software to small and mid-sized organisations. But we do work largely in that not-for-profit sector in the UK and we are looking at replicating that in the APAC region. Uh, we, as a profitable organisation, believe in giving back and every year each division or each um, region we nominate a charity that we work to, so I feel like we're socially responsible in that regard. And I was hoping to have the figures to because I was just blown away last year in the money that not only we raised as uh, employees, but access actually doubled whatever we raise. Uh, so they really do give back. Um, we also are awarded three days giving back days leave and we're hoping to use those days in working with some of the um, ideas we've got in working with David. So I myself am using one of those days on the 9th of December. The Variety Club is our nominated charity in the APAC region, and we're going to um, like pack some Marvel um, uh, base goods for children at Princess Margaret uh, Hospital. So that is um, that is a real uh, contribution, I guess, from that 
corporate sector. Uh, we also, in 2021, set up the Access Foundation, and that is nothing other than by name commercially to do with the Access Group, but uh, it is a foundation where there, where there is um, uh, money put aside for people to apply for grants for uh, where their needs are system, particularly in the technology space. Um, and I believe this sector could probably use some help there. Uh, I've just seen a notification um, today that for a foundation based in the UK, uh, there was £30,000 grant um, given to support um, a deaf a group of um, a deaf society to provide technology to help them um, you know, manage the community. So that's a little bit, uh, I guess, about um, you know, where we're trying to give back. And I personally look at what we call socially responsible corporate organisations. Um, and um, one of them in particular that I would mention that is I buy my toilet paper from the Who Gives a Crap website. Now, I don't know if you've seen it, but, it, you know, there are a lot of really good corporates out there, you know, giving back. I mean, that's a real global give back what they do. But you know, even the coffee pods where I buy my coffee pods give back a lot as well. So, yeah, suggesting that we get society to start and look at some of these, um, you know, responsible global organisations is probably uh, a start to assist if we're not getting what we want from government. So um, we are looking at working with UWA and the Centre for Public Value and Basically, what we do is we provide and get, assist in getting that data to the researchers that is required so you can then analyse that data and then lobby governments or stakeholders or, you know, with that research based, you know, to support what you're asking for because they, you can't always go with the problem if you, you've got to have, to some extent, a solution to put forward as well to be heard. So we're working closely with David um, to develop a model where, um, you know, we can make that data readily accessible uh, without putting that pressure on the sector to get that data, it, despite, you know, them uh, or yourselves in the sector wanting to contribute, but resources are not available and uh, this is about automating that process. Let's use the technology that you may not even be aware is there to get this, um, this information to the researchers. So how are we going to do this? <laughs> the, the lovely slide that they've given me. Um, I'm just going to play a short video. It doesn't take very long just on, um, you know, some of the tech that we actually have that's going to make this happen. So you would have seen us mention their access workspace. So this is a, a platform that we have developed that sits over all of our software products. So we deal in finance, we deal in payroll, we deal in HR. Um, we also uh, have websites with um, options for charities to uh, run fundraisers, et cetera, through their website. So we have quite a lot of um, software under our hood. With Access Workspace, what this allows would be a, a situation where we could collaborate or as an organisation with what, if you've got these products, our products, 
you can invite the researchers or outside stakeholders from your organisation in to access that data. So you're not being asked to provide this. Can you say, can you tell us this? And it could be non-financial data. Uh, I personally, uh, many years ago, was a management accountant at St John and God Hospital in Murdoch, and I certainly wasn't um, measuring numbers. I was measuring statistics uh, using a finance system. So that's um, that is, but we want that to be automated so it's not draining the sector to get this information to the researchers. So we have some really powerful apps uh, that allow that um, and analytical and BI tools that you hear a lot in the commercial sector. I don't know in the soft profit sector if you're using those or if they seem you know, just a bit out of reach maybe with the tech that you've got at the moment because obviously that advances at such a rapid pace. So that is, uh, you know, where the access group is uh, positioning ourselves and working with David to to try and get, make that uh, a little easier for the sector. Uh, again, we don't, we're very strong in that payroll, HR, rostering, award interpretation space as well. So that's another area that is quite big for this sector. Uh, so, uh, like I said, my name's Kim Roach. Uh, I've got my LinkedIn profile there. I don't know if you're going to share these or uh, my contact details. So, yeah, if anybody feels they need want to reach out about whatever the systems are that you are running, if you're getting that the data that you need to take that to that next step to and and yeah, and maybe we talked about change, you know. A, not only government, but the commercial sector, the, there is dollars there and get that um, social responsibility happening in the in the corporate sector as well. So I don't ever want to be somebody who's saying between morning tea. I think that's where we're going, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, thank you for your time. I know it's a little different to, you know, what you've been listening to, but it's all, it's all very, very interesting. And, yeah, I think we do need change. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim, and thank you to Access for the support. Scholars in the room, really happy to chat about that uh, project and the kind of data we're looking for. So please uh, yell out if you want to talk about that. It's um, We're trying to spread it as wide as we can. Uh, morning tea time. Uh, morning tea served out in the foyer. Please progress to uh, the foyer, grab a cup of coffee, grab something to eat. We start again at 11 o'clock in the breakout rooms. Uh, if you're not sure